Chapter Six of Uller Uprising. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sean O'Hara. Uller Uprising by H. Bean Piper. Chapter Six. The bad news came after the coffee. The last clatter of silverware and dishes ceased as the native servants finished clearing the table. There was a remaining clatter of cups and saucers. Liquor glasses tinkled, and an occasional cigarette lighter clicked. At the head table, the voices seemed louder. Don't lug it a mill, Salisworth, Brigadier General Barney Mortkowitz, the skilled military CO, was saying to the lady on his right. They're too confounded meek. Nowadays, nobody yells nidsudabit at you. Nobody sticks all four thumbs in the mouth and waves its fingers. Nobody commits nuisance on the sidewalk in front of you. They just stand and look at you like a farmer looking at a turkey the week before Christmas, and that I don't like. Oh, bosh jules keaveney the skilk resident agent at the head of the table exclaimed you soldiers are all alike begging your pardon general von schlichten he nodded in the direction of guest of honor if they don't bow and scrape to you and get off the sidewalk to let you pass you say they're insolent and need a lesson if they do you say they're plotting insurrection what i said mortgitz repeated was i expect a certain amount of disorder and a certain minimum show of hostility towards us from some of these geeks to conform to what I know to be our unpopularity with many of them. When I don't find it, I want to know why. I'm inclined, General von Schlichten came to his subordinate's support, to agree. The sudden absence of overt hostility is disquieting. Colonel Cheng Li, he called on a local intelligence officer and constabulary chief. This fellow Rakid was here about a month ago. Was there any noticeable disorder at that time? Anti-Terran demonstrations, attacks on company property or personnel, shooting at air cars that sort of thing no more than usual general in fact it was when rakid came here that the condition general mordkovitz was speaking of began to become conspicuous we did catch some of rakid's disciples trying to get in among the enlisted men of the tenth and you and i and the fifth zerk cavalry and promote disaffection that was reported at the time sir and acted upon as far as the civil administration would permit von schlichten replied and i might say that lieutenant governor blount has reported from Teagart, where he is now that the same unnatural absence of hostility exists there. Well, of course, General, Keevney said patronizingly. King Orgzild has things under pretty tight control at Keegar. He'd not allow a few fanatics to do anything to prejudice these spaceport negotiations. I wonder if the idea back that spaceport proposition isn't get us concentrated at Keegar, for Orgzild could wipe us out in one surprise blow, somebody down the table suggested. Oh, Orgzild wouldn't be crazy enough to try anything like that. Commander Dirk Prinsloo of the Aldebaran declared, You get away with it for just twelve months. Time would take for the news to get to Terra, and for Federation Space Navy Task Force to get here. And then there'd be little bits of radioactive geek floating around this system as far out as the orbit of Beta Hydra 7. That's quite true, von Schlichten agreed. Point is, does Orgzil know it? I doubt if he even believes there is a Terra. Then where in space does he think we come from? Keevney demanded. I believe he thinks Niflheim is our home, von Schlichten replied, or rather, the string of orbiters and artificial satellites around Niflheim, where he thinks Niflheim is, I wouldn't even try the guess. Well, it takes six months for a ship to go between here and Nif, Prince Luke considered. Because of the hyperdrive effect, the experience time of the voyage inside the ship is on the order of three weeks. Taking that as a figure, he'd estimate the distance at about a quarter million miles, assuming the velocity as being the speed of one of our contragravity ships here on Uller. I'm assuming he doesn't even know there's a hyperdrive. Yes, after he wiped us out, he might even consider the idea of an invasion of Niflheim with captured contragravity ships, Hideyoshi O'Leary chuckled. That would be a big laugh, if any of us were alive then to do any laughing. You don't really believe that, General, Keevney asked. His tone was still derisive, but under the derision was uncertainty. After all, von Schlichten had been on Uller for fifteen years to his two. Any question of geek psychology is wide open as far as I am concerned. Longer I stay here, the less I understand it. Von Schlichten finished his brandy and got out of cigarette case and lighter. I have an idea of the sort of garbled reports these spies of his, who spend a year on Niflheim as laborers, bring back. You know the line where Keith's been taking, of course, Colonel Chang Lee put in. He as much as says that Niflheim's our home, and that farms, where we raise our food here, and those evergreen plantings on Conk Isthmus, between here and Gronk, are the beginning of an attempt to drive out all native life from this planet and make it over for ourselves. And that savage didn't think an idea like that for himself. He got it from somebody like Orgzild. The black-bearded brigadier general added, 
You know, the main base off Nibelheim is practically self-supporting, with hydroponic gardens and animal tissue culture vats, and it's enough bigger than one of our city ships to pass for a little world. Yeah, somebody like Orgzild, or King Firkid here, could easily pick up an idea that that's our home planet. But King Kankad was talking about, Paula Quinton began. We were speaking of geeks, not Kragans. Punch looked and lit a cigarette and held his lighter out for hers. You saw that big beta hydra orrery at Kankad's observatory. Well, there's quite a little story about that. You know, it's generally realized by the natives here that Uller is a globe. The North Zerks have ridden all the way around it on Hippasaur back in high latitudes, and the Thalassic peoples at the equator have sailed all five equatorial seas and portaged all the isthmuses between. But of course, Uller is the center of the universe. The sun travels around it on a rather complicated double spiral track. As a theory, it explains most of what they're able to observe, and any minor effects that don't conform to it are just ignored. They have a model, a most ingenious affair run by clockwork at the University of Congress, to show the apparent movement and position of Beta Hydra in the sky. It does so fairly accurately. Well, some of our astronomers constructed this orrery and exhibited it to a gathering of the leading native scholars, who are also the high priests of the local religion, sort of combined Academy of Arts and Sciences and College of Cardinals. They almost were massacred. As soon as the assembled pundits saw this thing, they grasped its meaning and began geeking and screeding and yorking and squawking and brandishing knives. It was blasphemous and sacrilegious, and undermined the faith and invalidated the whole logic system. I was Brigadier General in command of Conquerk Military District then, the post them Mazongwe has now. When I got a riot call from the university, I hustled around with a company of Kragans, and we cleared the hall with the bayonet, and ran the reverend professors out onto the campus. And after we got things in hand, the Kragans crowded around the orrery, trying to set it up to show the existing position of the planet relative to the primary and figure out the theory back of it. They were very much interested. Some of them must have sent word home about it, because Kankad came in the next ship, wanting to see it. He was so much taken with it that Sid Harrington gave it to him. It's one of his most cherished possessions, but the Concrook pundits bite all four thumbs and wave their fingers every time they think of it. He warmed his coffee from a controlled temperature pot. You can't use Kragan thinking on any subject as a criterion of what somebody like Urzil's opinion will be. I never could understand the admiration some of you military people have for these cutthroats, Keevney declared. Well, yes, I can. You people like them because they do your dirty work for you. He reads Stanley Brown, too, all that, Hideyoshi O'Leary said. Miss Quentin, how do you like your visit to Kankad's town? Still think the Kragans are cultural mongrels? Why, they're wonderful. I never expected anything like it. They just seemed to have picked up everything they could from us, and then gone on from there to develop culture of their own with our techniques. For instance, those big guns, the ones they call the Ridge Battery, that they built for themselves. They aren't copies of Terran guns. They don't look like our work, or give the feel our work would. And that telescope at the observatory, she continued. Did they build that, too? Yes, all we furnished was a couple textbooks on lens grinding and telescope design, and a book on optics. You see, when you made that deal with them, they realized we weren't any better fighters than they were. We just had better weapons. To have the same kind of weapons, they'd have to learn to make them. And once they began studying technology, they found that they had to study science. Weapon making was the entering wedge. After that, they found they could use the same skills to make anything else they wanted. Give them another century or so, and they'll be one of the great races of the galaxy. Yes, and it's a good thing they're our friends, too, Morgavitz added. I'm only sorry there's so few of them and so many of the geeks. Yes, the company ought to let us stockpile nuclear weapons here, just be on the safe side, another officer, farther down the table said. Well, I'm not exactly in favor of that, Punch looked and replied. It's the same principle as not allowing guards, who have to go in among the convicts to carry firearms. If somebody like Orgzild got a hold of a nuclear bomb, even a little old first-century H-bomb, he could use it for a model and construct a hundred like it, with all the plutonium we've been handing out for power reactors. And there are too few of us, and we're concentrating in too few places to last long if that happened. What this planet needs, though, is a visit by a fifty-odd ship task force of the Space Navy, just to show the geeks what we have back of us. After a show like that, there'd be a lot less znid pseudobit around here. General, I deplore that sort of talk, Keevney said. I hear too much of this mailed fist and rattling saber stuff from some of the junior officers here, without here giving continence and encouragement to it. We're here to earn dividends for the stockholders of the Uller Company, and we can only do that by gaining the friendship and respect of the natives. Mr. Keevney, Paula Quinton spoke up, I doubt if even you would seriously accuse the Extraterrestrials Rights Association of favoring what you call mailed fist and rattling saber policy. We've done everything in our power to help those people, and if anybody should have their friendship, we should. 
Well, only five days ago, in Conkrook, Mr. Mohammed Ferreira and I were attacked by a mob. Our native air car driver was murdered, and if it hadn't been for General von Schlichten and his soldiers, we'd have lost our lives. Mr. Ferreira is still hospitalized as a result of injuries he received. It seems that General von Schlichten and his Kragans aren't trying to get friendship and confidence. They're willing to settle for respect in the only way they can get it, by hitting harder and quicker than the geeks can. Somebody down the table, one of the military, of course, said, Hear, hear! Von Schlichten came as close as a man wearing monocle can to winking at Paula. Good girl, he thought. She's starting to play for the army team. Well, of course, Evening began, and he stopped as a Terran sergeant came up to the table and bent over Barney Mordkovitz's shoulder, whispering urgently. The black-bearded brigadier rose immediately, taking his belt from the back of his chair and putting it on. Motioning the sergeant to accompany him, he spoke briefly to Keevney, and then came around the table to where von Schlichten sat, the resident agent accompanying him. Message just came in from Conquest, General, he said softly. Sid Harrington's dead. It took von Schlichten all of a second to grasp what had been said. Good God! When? How? Here's all we know, sir, the sergeant said, giving him a radio print slip. Came in ten minutes ago. It was an all-station priority telecast. Governor General Harrington had died suddenly, in his room, at 2210. There were no details. He glanced at his watch. It was 2243. Konkrook and Skilk were in the same time zone. That was fast work. He handed the slip to Mordkovitz, who gave it to Keevney. You from the telecast station, Sergeant? he asked. All right, let's go. Wait a minute, General. Keevney put out a hand to detain him as he took his belt and put it on. How about this? He gestured nervously with the radio print slip. Get up and make an announcement now. Von Schlichten told him, fastening the buckle and hitching his pistol and survival kit into place. It'll be out all over the planet in half an hour. Never hold news out unnecessarily. He stubbed out his cigarette. Come on, Sergeant. As he hurried from the banquet room, he could hear Keevney tapping on his wine glass. Everybody, please, let me have your attention. There's just come in a piece of the most tragic news. End of chapter 6